Uh, obviously, yeah. I mean, in the context of what we've been talking about this morning, you listen to the details of what happened on Watergate. It sounds almost quaint by comparison, as important as it was. But there's that moment that Pete talked about where Senator Goldwater goes down to the White House and says, effectively, it's over, Mr. President. Right. You're going to get impeached. We're going to run you out of office unless you resign. Haven't seen those voices with President Trump, obviously. <laughs> we sure haven't. Let's bring in now, I, I'll, I'll get it right this time, NBC News presidential historian Michael Bachelos. Also, MSNBC legal analyst Jill Weinbank. She was one of three assistant Watergate special prosecutors in the obstruction of justice trial against President Nixon's top aides. It's great to have both of you here. You know, Michael, as I look back at that Pete Williams package, and I'm just transfixed. I was younger while it was happening, but I, I, I remember it happening. Uh, and I'm just struck by the arrogance, uh, of course, the corruption, but also just the idiocy of it all and how unnecessary it was. Nixon would win 49 states. There's right. nothing they would have ever found in there that would have helped them win the 50. <laughs> it was just uh, what 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 a lesson uh, for, for it should have been a lesson for all politicians, but it really did. It changed the way Washington worked. Uh, it did, and one way it changed it. I loved what you said a few minutes earlier, Joe, about the fact that. If a president misbehaves, everyone has to see that he's held to account by the legal system and you know goes to court and maybe goes to jail if necessary. That was true with Nixon. You know, the Watergate hearings were not just, you know, let's find out some stuff about Watergate. That led to a number of indictments. A lot of Nixon's people went to prison. If Nixon had not been pardoned by Gerald Ford, Nixon might have gone to prison too. That was a big lesson to people throughout our political system and throughout our society. You, know, you cross a line, you cross a legal line, you pay for it. Con contrast that with this moment now. Yeah, and you know, Jill, also looking at Pete's package, I, you know, you, you see a young Woodward and Bernstein. You you see uh, the Democratic committees, and I just there's a part of me after the, that denial the morning after, it said, you know, it, it wasn't a foregone conclusion that these people were going to be brought to justice. Talk about that process, and if you ever had doubts that Nixon and his team would ultimately be brought to justice. Let me answer your second question first. Um, absolutely, I did not doubt that there would be justice done because we had a team of people who were morally c committed to making sure that justice was done. And we had the investigative tools we needed. We were independent of the Department of Justice. The rule that we were operating under in terms of the special prosecutor were different than current ones, and we did have much more independence so that we could pursue things. And once we found out that we could corroborate our chief witness, who was John Dean, with the tapes, we knew that we could commit. The question was, we had enough evidence to indict the president, but should we do it? I thought we should, even when he was sitting president. Leon Jaworski, who was by then the special prosecutor because of the Saturday Night Massacre, said, no, impeachment is the only proper solution. And I wonder now if we had actually indicted him instead of naming him an unindicted co-conspirator, whether maybe Donald Trump would have seen the accountability that would have stopped him from taking the steps that he has taken now, which are certainly more serious than just covering up a break-in, which was bad enough. He was abusing right. his power, Richard Nixon, and he was definitely obstructing justice. There's no question. And he knew about the burglary, and he knew about the connection to the DNC, uh, to the committee to reelect, known as Creep, and to the White House as early as June 19th. We right. know that because the tape of June 20th, which got erased, we now have the voice of Haldeman describing what is missing from that recording. And he says, and I talked to the president on the plane back yesterday. So that means that on the 19th, they had a conversation and the president right. knew as early as then and then said, use the CIA to stop the FBI from following the money. Yeah. Hey, Caddy, I'm wondering, though, um, without those tapes, Caddy K, 
what uh, what would be the possibility that the Nixon White House was brought to justice? Of course, it's a question that we'll um, we'll never know the answer to completely. But my gosh, it certainly went a long way uh, into finishing Richard Nixon's political career. Yeah, now and now we're all wondering, you know, how we can draw conclusions from what we're hearing from the January the 6th committee based on what happened uh, with Nixon and what the lessons are for us. And Michael Bestos, when you look and picking up on the conversation we had with Chuck Rosenberg earlier in the program, when you look at what is happening in these January the 6th uh, committee hearings and the possibility of some kind of statute having been breached by President Trump. What do you see? Do you see uh, evidence coming out of what is being f found by the January the 6th committee that points to intent on the part of President Trump? Because that seems to be what Chuck was saying was perhaps still the missing element at the moment. Absolutely, Caddy. You remember when people were arguing that this was just sort of a spontaneous uprise against the Capitol? No one planned it. Maybe it was even just like visiting tourists. What the committee has done step by step is to show that this is a diabolical plot to fix the 2020 election, use violence to do it, and attack the Congress and the Capitol. And, and perhaps it would have had the effect of destroying our democracy by destroying the tradition of peaceful transfer of power. And look at earlier in 2020, 20, uh, you know, Trump, for instance, in September 2020, was asked by a reporter, you know, will you commit to peaceful transfer of power, whatever happens in the election? And Trump refused. He says, we'll see what happens. That was a very big red flag. So at the end of these hearings, it's likely what we're going to see is that this was a coup d'etat and an insurrection planned by a president of the United States that could have ended our democratic system. If a president, president does yeah. that and gets away with it, then we are in, living in a country that's anarchy. And that's what we're looking at with these hearings right now. Michael Beschloss and Jill Wine-Banks, who was a assistant to the special prosecutor during Watergate, thank you both for being with us this morning. Let's